Canada curious? This is the Yes We Canada podcast, the progressive's guide to getting the fuck out. This episode, How to Sex a Canadian. Hi, I'm Matt Zimbel in Montreal. This episode is about sex. Well, it's about sex and love. Because in Canada, if you're not in love, you don't have sex. We are a polite people. I mean, we don't have casual sex in Canada. Sex here is formal. We fall in love, then we make love. That's the way it rolls up here. We also sometimes tell the truth in podcasts. Sometimes. Because this show is about sex, you're going to obviously want to know Well, how do I use the podcast? I mean, should I get the kids out of the room? Is there stuff my spouse shouldn't hear? Should I be using a private window on my browser? And I just want to start by assuring you that the show is fine. They're safe. There's nothing graphic or pornographic about it. We're in Canada. We're a polite people. One of our national treasures in Canada is a singer-songwriter named Nancy White. Nancy is a political and social satirist who has put contemporary Canadian life to song. In her early career, she called herself the civil service songwriter. And for 18 years, every week, Nancy would write a newsworthy topical song for the CBC National Radio show called Sunday Morning. Being Canadian, Nancy's humble, of course, and she might be prone to call these songs ditties. No, I said ditties. But really, they were wonderfully crafted songs, smart, biting, funny, and well-played. They were written on a Wednesday, recorded on a Friday, and aired on a Sunday. A song cycle of the news cycle. I was driving to Cape Breton on a cold September night When a CBC announcer described an awesome sight It's causing folks to cross themselves, it's causing jaws to drop The face of Jesus has appeared on a bread or a coffee shop A favorite subject for Nancy was the Canadian people's international reputation for politeness. This is how she described a typical Canadian seduction. (laughs) Hey, okay, okay, hey, hey, would you like to have sex? Oh, only if you're having some yourself. When you get here, you'll soon realize that you're considered exotic. I said exotic, not erotic. Stay with me here. As a red-blooded American, you're brash, bold, a know-what-you-kind-of-want person. We take these truths to be self-evident. Bam! I mean, who says shit like that? Only supremely confident people like you. Bravo. So when you get to Canada and start courting, you'll find Canadians to be less brash, but perhaps more mysterious. Canadians are known to be very obedient citizens, much less rebellious than y'all, which is perhaps why the most popular porn in Canada features people smoking while having sex. Herb, eh, will you look at that? They're smoking indoors. (laughs) Well, I never. (laughs) Canadians have unique sexual capabilities. Oh, now you're intrigued, aren't you? 8% of Canadians claim to have had sex in a canoe. Now, I mean, think about that for a second. That is some mighty, highly skilled sex. It should be an Olympic category, like maybe for just polar countries, you know? Imagine the play-by-play. He's feathering and she's coming in second. Ouch, this must hurt. Oh, he lost by one-tenth of a second. Montreal has always had a reputation for sex, sin, and generally decadent behavior. During Prohibition in the United States, Montreal became America's go-to sin city. There were some bad boy Montreal Jews by the name of the Bromfmans. You may be familiar with their former little spirits company, Seagram. They got started bootlegging liquor into your country by sending it to Newfoundland to be picked up by the Mexican cartels. Just kidding about the cartel part. They hadn't been invented yet. But the Bronfmans did send all their illicit booze to Newfoundland to be picked up and brought to Boston. Now, I don't think we can responsibly do an episode about sex in Canada without mentioning 
that in Newfoundland, and for your citizenship test, remember, Newfoundland is the last province to join the Canadian Federation in what year? We did this on other shows. Come on, you should know this. 1949. Anyway, in Newfoundland, there is a town called Dildo. I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up. You couldn't make stuff like this up. The Late Show host Jimmy Kimmel recently decided to run for mayor of Dildo. I understand that I'm not Canadian, but I figure if we can have a dildo running America, why can't we have an American running dildo? I will get things dill done if it's the last thing I dill do. Clearly a vacuous American publicity stunt, and you guys are so good at those things, but, you know, he could probably win, and he'd probably do a decent job until he lost interest and decided to run for mayor of another Newfoundland town called Come By Chance which is just 29 miles or 46 kilometers down the road from Dildo. Is this on? Is this on? When I was the mayor of Dildo, the people would never come by chance. Okay, we're done with cheap shots on Newfoundland town names. We're heading back to Montreal, Sin City. Now that you go to Las Vegas for your sins, Montreal is much better behaved. But it's the porn capital of the world. The Montreal company that owns the largest pornography website aggregator in the world is called Pornhub. Its corporate headquarters is very discreet, housed in an industrial park building off a major highway. Normally, the tenant of this kind of building would be like an ad agency or a fashion house head office. Pornhub will tell you that they're not really a porn company as such. They're more of a tech developer, which is like saying, I read Playboy for the articles of clothing the women were missing. Now, every country has their cultural sexual icons, and Canada's no different. We had two, now we have one. The first, singer-songwriter, poet Leonard Cohen, also known as the godfather of gloom, became the object of desire for women all over the world with his thoughtful and troubled romantic point of view. There was a... Um... A review of the concert in, uh, I think it was Melody Maker. They said, uh, Leonard Cohen is a boring old drone and should go the fuck back to Canada where he belongs. No, nothing has quite r reached the heights of that uh, savagery. In some places in the world, they consider me an accomplished stylist. As I mentioned on previous shows, I worked with Leonard in the 90s, and the spell he cast on women was gentlemanly, even courtly but powerful. My bandmates would shake their heads in awe at the way women would swoon in Leonard's presence and with nary a glance at any of us. And As band leader, one of my responsibilities was to keep everybody motivated. So I told the band, guys, consider yourselves lucky. Imagine the expectations. Mm, that's a lot of pressure. Our other sexual icon is the model, actor, vegan, activist, and husband collector, with four so far in the collection, Pamela Anderson. Hailing from British Columbia, she got her start when she was in the audience at a Canadian Football League game. The Jumbotron director spotted her in the crowd, thought she was cute, and put an image of her up on the Jumbotron. You see, when you get to Canada, magic can happen. Pretty girl flashed... No, flashed is not the right word. Pretty girl viewed on a jumbotron at a CFL game goes on to do more covers of Playboy magazine than anyone else in history for going to a CFL game. You know, it's interesting when you think about the difference between these two sex symbols. I think women come across as being a little more profound in their choice here. A poet, a thinker, and... There is something Dolly Parton-esque about Pamela Anderson. It's like bombshelling is a verb and also a career. In fact, she says she doesn't have a career. Her breasts have a career. Ms. Anderson has been an activist in many issues, including animal rights and efforts to free the Australian activist Julian Assange. And we like our Canadian sex symbols hot and activist. When you get to Canada, if you meet her, which is highly likely since we all know each other up here, I'd maybe not talk to her too much about your newfound knowledge of smoked meat. As a more progressive society than the United States, Canada reluctantly led on same-sex marriage. 
Shockingly, prim and proper Ontario was ahead of libidinous Quebec on this front. Usually it's the other way around, but Quebec has strong and enduring ties to the Roman Catholic Church which, shockingly, has been kind of lukewarm on the subject of same-sex marriage. In June of 2003, an Ontario appeal court recognized same-sex marriage, instantly making Toronto the gay marriage capital of North America, much to the delight of local florists and caterers. With Ontario's leadership, Canada did what it does best. Um, studied gay union for two years, until July of 2005, when Parliament enacted the Civil Marriage Act. Marriage is a federal issue in Canada, so with this bill signed into law, gay marriage was legal, nationally, everywhere, except remember our Texas, the province of Alberta? You know, the three C's, cattle, crude, and conservatism? Well, Alberta pledged to prohibit gay union. The sanctity of the union between a man and a woman is blah, 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 blah until they caved, and now you can get married anywhere in Canada, no matter what the gender of your spouse. And this could be important to you. Citizenship and Immigration Canada also acknowledges same-sex marriage. So come to Canada, bring a spouse, any gender will do. The one thing that was most interesting in the debate on same-sex marriage was the position of our cute Republican wannabes, the Conservative Party. This will not surprise you, but they opposed the Civil Marriage Act. I remember spending all night long with my honorable colleague uh, when, when Order. I would like to ask for some maturity from some members in this place. This will surprise you. Among conservative ranks, they had a number of very lightly closeted senior cabinet ministers. You've no doubt heard that line that every American politician was born in a log cabin he built by himself. Timber! Well, in the U.S., your gay Republicans created a group called the Log Cabin Republicans. Why on earth would someone want to become a member of a group that detests them? I have no idea. So I've always been suspicious of the Log Cabin Republicans, and I've always been suspicious about my suspicions. Was I inadvertently being heteronormative? So, I asked my leftist gay cousin, am I being discriminatory by not trusting gay social conservatives like the log cabin Republicans? Nah, he said, I wouldn't trust any of those fuckers. Okay, phew. If you're a log cabin Republican, first of all, wow, <laughs> welcome to the podcast, episode 16, how the hell did you get here? Secondly, as a conservative, you're not actually thinking of immigrating to progressive Canada, Stan, are you? Well, if you do, that's great. We need more people up here, and you are most welcome. And good news, you can join a group of fellow conservatives, also known as Tories, that was started in 2015 called LGB Tory. I should mention that the trans folks were not amused that the T in LGBT got co-opted for Tory, rather than trans, but other than that, there seems to be wide acceptance of LGBT Tory up here. They march in the gay pride parades, even if their conservative leaders refuse to join them. Which recalls a wonderful quote from a very famous New York Jew, Groucho Marx, who said, I don't want to belong to any club that would have me as a member. Log cabin Republicans, look, you are welcome here. Adding to our gay population is fine by me. I take a much dimmer view of you adding to our conservative population. 